Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be breaking down college football's week three, Saturday main slate of the FS action on DraftKings and FanDuel. I mean, it's week three, but I guess you count week zero. It might technically be week four. Notre Dame's playing their fourth game. So I don't know. It's, it's weird calling college football by week, but it's Saturday, September 16th that we are looking at. So uh, we are going to break down the main slate on DraftKings and FanDuel. That is the one that starts at noon Eastern time. We're going to break down the games and teams that you want to target. And then we're going to talk about our favorite plays at the quarterback, running back, and wide receiver positions, who makes for good plays, who makes for bad plays, and talk about lineup strategies such as stacks and bringbacks and all that fun stuff. Now, this episode is coming to you a little bit later than I planned on. I am going to try my best to get on a weekly schedule of these episodes. We are doing weekly golf, college football, and NFL content. So make sure you subscribe to the channel or to the audio feed uh, so that way you can notify when all those episodes drop. But I'm going to try to get myself in a weekly routine where I can get this episode out to you guys at the same time every week. Um, This one's a little bit different. If you have been a longtime member of the channel, you are probably aware by now that um, my wife has given birth to our baby girl, Ava. Um, And so Ava is now eight days old. And so, you know, it's been a little bit of an adjustment period trying to find time, you know, to find, you you know, find time to do the research and then get these recorded while also tending to Ava and Gabby's needs as well. So, um, yeah, it's super excited to have the little bundle of joy in my life and, um, going to try to do my best to get a weekly routine going where I can get these out to you guys and still uh, fulfill all of my fatherly duties because I love that little baby so much. Anyway, enough with the introduction. Let's go ahead and start talking about the games you need to be looking at for the Saturday main All right, so taking a look at the board here with the point spreads courtesy of FanDuel Sportsbook, there's not really one game that really stands out as like a traditional shootout in the sense of the word where you have a high point total and it's projected to be a close game as well. Um, The closest to that would probably be the LSU-Mississippi State game. LSU is 9.5 point favorites. The total in that one is 54.5. So the total is projected to be about 32 to 22-ish, accounting for rounding. And that's probably the most traditional shootout out game that you see. Another one that I think is worth targeting would be Kansas State in Missouri. Kansas State's defense hasn't really been tested yet, so I definitely think Missouri should be able to put up some points on them, at least to a more of an extent than Kansas State's first two opponents have. That one has a total of 47.5, and and Kansas State is 4.5 point favorites. Now, there are some projected blowouts on this slate as well, where you can get some of these teams that are, you know, projected high point totals. Just keep in mind, if you're playing somebody from a blowout, be ready for them to, you know, sit for a quarter or a half in case, you know, their team is up 40 points at halftime. So the first blowout on the slate is projected to be Georgia Southern at Wisconsin. I tend to think this game might be closer than people think. I think Georgia Southern is going to be able to put up points. This is, uh, I believe, the highest total of the slate as well. It's 64 and a half. Um, Wisconsin is about 20 point favorites. So they're projected to beat Georgia Southern about 42 to 22 when you round. Uh, Another big time blowout is um, the Alabama and South Florida game. In that game, Alabama's 31.5 point favorites. The score is projected to be Alabama um, 46 to 14, and that one's that's pretty darn high. Um, and then you have another one in Western Kentucky, Ohio State. Ohio State is projected to beat Western Kentucky 46 to 19. Western Kentucky has a really good offense for a Commerce USA team, so that total of 19, I would tend to think that they might be able to get higher than that. And if they put up three touchdowns, then some of the guys on their team in this slate are going to be viable to play. And then you've got two other high point totals. Oregon State is implied 36 points, and Florida State is implied 40 points. So those would just be some teams to target here on this DraftKings main slate. Now, in terms of the individual plays, let's go ahead and start breaking it down at the quarterback position. So Cam Rising of Utah is the top um, salary on the board at the quarterback position on DraftKings. And look, he's just a pass for me. Like he's $9,900, which is the highest on the slate. And even if he does play, I don't think he's got the upside to really pay off that salary. Like it just seems a little high for what we know about Cam Rising. And what we know about this game, Utah is playing Weber State. There is no spread on this game. It's FBS versus FCS matchup. Quite frankly, I don't know what it's doing on the slate, but it's going to be a big blowout. And for a guy who's already banged up, are they really going to risk him getting hurt against Weber State? I don't see it happening. I don't see him playing the full game, and I see them being pretty run heavy as well. So I just don't really see Cam Rising as a play in my opinion. Now from there, 
you got some intriguing options that are above 9K, which we really didn't have a whole lot of last week. Jordan Travis of Florida State is the first one. Um, he is, in my opinion, the top option on the slate. Um, FSU's implied 40 points like we just went over, and he showed his upside earlier this season with a 41.5 fantasy point performance against LSU, so we know he's got a high ceiling. And he hasn't really ran the ball a whole lot so far this season, You know, which is 13 rushing attempts total. It, it would not be uncommon for him to have that many in a game last year. So I think Jordan Travis, there's a lot of untapped potential here, and I guess tapped potential because he has had one big game so far. And I just see him getting a, a lot of fantasy points there in this game against Boston College. The only risk you would run is just, you know, if their running backs happen to run in the touchdowns. But pretty much so far this season, as Florida State's been scoring, Jordan Travis has been scoring as well. So he is, in my opinion, one of the top plays on the slate. Kyle McCord of Ohio State started to find his footing last week against an FCS opponent against Youngstown State. Um, week one he, against Indiana, he did not look good. Week two, he did. And so I think that there might be a little bit of a learning curve to this offense, and I think he's starting to get there. Now, the Western Kentucky defense is going to be slightly better than what he saw against Youngstown State. So I don't think Kyle McCord has the same ceiling as some of these other quarterbacks that are in the 9K range, but I definitely like the fact that this game does have a little bit of shootout potential, and he is in an offense that has absolutely elite skill players all around him. Now, next up above 9K is Jalen Milrow of Alabama. Now, I think there's a little bit of a risk and reward here with Jalen Milrow. So I would expect just on paper this game to look like Bama's first matchup against Middle Tennessee State, where they're just more talented across the board at every position on the field. Milrow is able to run, he's able to throw, and he's able to rack up fantasy points like he did with 36 and a half fantasy points in that game. Now, the one concern for Milrow, though, is there's starting to be rumblings that, that Milrow's not the long-term solution at quarterback for Alabama. And so what you may see is you may see a series or two for a backup like Tyler Buckner. And if that happens, then that absolutely kills all of Milrow's fantasy upside. If Milrow plays every series of this game, then I have no doubt in my mind he can get to 30 fantasy points. But if he does end up ceding time to Buckner, that absolutely hurts his fantasy upside. Milrow is also the rare guy that because he does so much of his scoring with his legs and because so many of his targets are just spread around to all kinds of guys in this receiving core, I'm absolutely fine playing Milrow unstacked with no Alabama skill players around him. Now, the next little tier, the upper 8K range, um, you got DJ Uyangalale, you got Michael Pratt, and you got Jaden Daniels. And I like all three, but I find all three of them to be about equal footing, in my opinion. They all have 30 to 35 fantasy point upside. They all are in matchups where their team should score 30 to 40 points, and they're going to be the ones accounting for those points. No problem playing either of those three guys. Now, Sam Hartman is a guy that I do want to talk about. He is, in my opinion, the perfect cash game play. He's playing for an offense in Notre Dame right now that's probably going to score more than 40 points against Central Michigan, and he's thrown for four touchdowns in each of his first two games, or I believe first three games if you include the Navy game. And um, Notre Dame scored over 40 points in all those games. So I just think that he's going to continue to follow that script and continue to rack up, you know, 20 plus fantasy point performances. Now, does he have the same upside as some of these other guys like a Jaden Daniels or like a Jordan Travis who uses their legs a lot? I don't think so, but I think that Sam Hartman has one of the highest floors on the slate. He's playing elite real life football and really solid fantasy football right now. So Sam Hartman, in my opinion, great option in cash game formats, but probably not the upside to win you a GPP tournament. Now, one of my favorite quarterback plays on the slate is going to be Will Howard of Kansas State. So, Will Howard is a guy who has a lot of rushing upside. Um, you know, he's scored three rushing touchdowns on the season already, and he's gotten over 30 fantasy points in both games so far. In my opinion, he's a guy who has legitimate 40 fantasy point upside because of what he can do through the air and with his legs. And when they get in the red zone, they really look to use him as a primary runner. He doesn't rack up a whole lot of rushing yards, but he does rack up the touchdowns because of where he runs the football not how often he runs the football. So I really do like Will Howard in this one. Kansas State's projected to win this game. I think it's going to be a good game script for him. Like, I cannot stress enough how good of a play I think Will Howard is against this Missouri defense. Now, Drew Auer of Penn State. Aller, Aller, Alar. I think it's Aller. Yeah, I'm going to go with Aller. Drew Aller of Penn State has some sneaky upside, in my opinion. He scored over 20 fantasy points in both games so far. And Illinois, they're kind of a sneaky bad 
bad defense. Like, they've given up 28 real points in both games they've played so far. So if Penn State gets to 28 points, I kind of like the, you know, possibility of Auer throwing three to four touchdown passes if Penn State is getting there. So I, I really do like Drew Auer as a play. I think he's a sneaky upside play who's probably not going to be super highly owned. Now, after Auer, you've got a lot of guys in the 7K range that, in my opinion, are best played as game stacks. Like the first one I'm going to talk about, Will Rogers. If you want to play Jaden Daniels, you can absolutely smash Will Rogers in that super flex spot. And then if this game ends up being a back and forth shootout, then you're going to get fantasy points coming and going from both sides, which will be an absolutely like possible way to win. Some of my best lineups so far in GPPs have been when I've played both quarterbacks in the same game. Now, what I generally try to do is to find two games that I like a lot and kind of mix and match all combinations of the quarterbacks. But what generally ends up happening is the two quarterbacks that are in the same game give me just as much upside as playing two that are in opposite games if the game just happens to turn into a shootout. So I don't mind playing Will Rogers in a game stack with Jaden Daniels. I don't mind playing him alone. I thought last week was kind of an anomaly how he only threw 17 passes against Arizona, but he also counted for three touchdowns. So I do think that Will Rogers is a pretty solid play against LSU and especially as a game stack type play. Now some other game stack type plays, you've got Brady Cook of Missouri going against Kansas State. And then you've got an interesting like double stack opportunity where you've got Jack Plummer of Louisville and Taven Jackson of Indiana going against each other. That game has sneaky shootout potential and they're both pretty cheap. I would have no problem playing both Plummer and Taven Jackson in that one. And then the last value play that I want to talk about uh, from a game stagging perspective is Austin Reed of Western Kentucky. Like we mentioned in the intro, if Western Kentucky gets to three touchdowns, then it's probably going to be Reed throwing them. Like he is like a gunslinger. He throws the ball all over the yard. Western Kentucky throws the ball a lot. And so if they get to three touchdowns, it's probably going to be because Reed threw three touchdowns. And if he throws three touchdowns, gets you maybe 200 yards, that's enough to pay off his price tag at $5,500, which I think is super cheap. And I don't think you will see him price that cheap again this season. So I really do like Austin Reed as a value quarterback from that perspective. Now, the last value quarterback that I do want to talk about is Riley Leonard of Duke. So it seems like just yesterday we watched him just run all over Clemson on Labor Day night. I was actually in the hospital watching that game on my phone. Um, but, I mean, he's got a lot of upside. And he had 24.8 fantasy points in that game against Clemson, largely because of what he did with his legs. And, you know, Duke's a very run-first offense, don't get me wrong, but they use Leonard as a ball carrier. And so he's going to give you fancy points, you know, both running and throwing. And a matchup against Northwestern where I expect Duke to win, I think he's a he's not going to be at this price tag for very long. I really do like Riley Leonard this week. All right, that does it for the quarterback position. If you guys like what you're seeing so far here in the video, make sure on YouTube, hit that like button. It really helps me out a lot. And subscribe to the channel so you're notified when all of our weekly golf, college football, and NFL content drops. If you're listening on audio, you can subscribe as well. You can also um, rate and review, which really shows me a lot of support and really helps me out a lot. All right, let's go ahead and switch gears just a second. Let's talk about some running back. All right, so the running back position is kind of an interesting one to figure out this week. What you've got a lot of at the top of the board for running backs is guys that are playing for teams who are likely going to win their game in a blowout, which presents with itself a little bit of risk and reward because you want to make sure that if they win in a blowout and they're going to be sitting for the remaining quarter or a half that they get to what they need to get to in that half or three quarters that they're playing. It also presents a super leverage opportunity. If you want to play a backup running back on one of these teams and just gamble that they're going to score when they're in the game, it's absolutely a possibility. It's a strategy that's worked before. It's also super high risk. Anyway, the guy that I think is the top play at the running back position is Audric Estime of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. So Estime has just been really good so far in 2023 and he really has done it in a way that's really unique so estimate is the irish's top running back like it's not really up for debate he's pretty much averaging 15 touches a game which doesn't sound like a whole lot but you got to remember the type of games they played and they pretty much won every game so far in a blowout well guess what this is probably going to be a blowout again against central michigan a team from the mac that i think is just simply overmatched against this notre dame offensive line so i think that estimate is going to be able to run wild and he really probably only needs 10 to 12 touches to hit that you. And if he continues to get in the range of 15, I think he can have a field day against this Central Michigan defense. And he has the potential to break off long runs, What like we saw with him against NC State right after that three-hour long lightning delay last Saturday. And so I really do like Audric Estime. In my opinion, he's the top running back play on the slate. Now below Estime, you have the start of one of the most frustrating committees 
in all of college football right now, which is Travion Henderson of Ohio State. Look, right now, Travion Henderson and Mayan Williams are in like a dead split 50-50 committee. And there's going to be games where Henderson goes off. There's going to be games where Williams goes off. There's going to be games where both of them go off. There's going to be games where neither of them goes off. It's really anything can happen with this Buckeyes backfield. And so looking at it the way I'm looking at it now, where we kind of have no lean as to who is going to be the top Ohio State running back in a game where they're probably going to win by two or three touchdowns. I'm cool just not playing either of these guys. Now, do both of them have their own upside? Yeah. Like, are they going to be probably pretty lowly owned? Yeah. But I just think there's no stability with this situation. And I would rather not play a guy who might give me like five carries for 27 yards at the end of the day. And so, especially when I'm paying $7,000 on DraftKings to do so. So I'm out on the Ohio State running backs until we can get a little more clarity as to who's going to be getting those carries. Now, speaking of committee, Wisconsin, for like the first time in a long time, is a true committee with Braylon Allen and Ches Malusi. Um, right now, Allen, like, I believe has slightly more total. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Malusi has slightly more total carries on the season than Allen. He's actually, uh, like, up on one carry to Braylon Allen. So I really don't know what to make of this situation. Heading into this season, Braylon Allen was, like, the clear leader, in, like, in the clubhouse for the guy that might be, the, you know, the starting running back. But I don't know. I just really don't know what's going to happen. I think it might have been a product of last week, Wisconsin trailing most of the way. Maybe Malusi is more of the passing down back, uh, even though he doesn't really catch the ball. I don't know. I, I don't know why Malusi got more carries against Washington State, but I do think that this is a situation that is worth monitoring. And I do think this is a situation where right now, unlike Ohio State, I think both of these running backs are getting enough work that they are playable. I don't mind playing one of them, but I, I do think there's a little bit of risk involved. I would prefer to play one of the Ohio's, let me rephrase, I would prefer to play one of the Wisconsin backs ahead of one of the Ohio State backs because both of them are getting more work than Henderson and Williams. Now, the undisputed workhorse in the Missouri backfield right now is Cody Schrader. Uh, Pete is still there, but, you know, right now Schrader is really just dominating the carries. Through two games, he's had 41 carries, averaging a little over 20 a game, at least 18 carries in both games. However, the matchup against Kansas State is a little bit tougher than each of the first two games have been for Missouri. Now, Kansas State hasn't really been tested yet, so I don't necessarily trust that big red fourth next to their name on DraftKings, but I do think that this is a little bit of a tougher situation than a lot of the other top running backs are going to be with this week. Now, if you want to game stack this game, maybe get you a little Will Howard, get you a Kansas State receiver, Missouri receiver, more on them later, and then play Cody Schrader as opposed to Brady Cook. I don't think that's a bad strategy either, especially if you want to go that route. But I do think that Schrader is in a better situation than the Ohio State and the Wisconsin running backs, but a worse matchup than the Wisconsin and the Ohio State running backs. Now, Jaquavius Marks in Mississippi State has been getting an insane workload through two games. And again, kind of like with Cody Schrader, this is not the ideal situation going up against this LSU defense, but Marks' workload has been wild because he's averaging over 20 carries per game and he's had four receptions in both games. And so you're looking at a scenario here where if Mississippi State's trailing and they're throwing, Marks is still going to be on the field. He can get you a lot of cheap fantasy points just by racking up receptions, even if it's not with a whole lot of yards. So Marks is in play for me this week for that reason, even though the matchup against LSU is not that great. Now, if you were looking for a guy who has true slate-breaking upside, let me present to you Jaquindon Jackson of Utah. So we've talked about him already this season because, you know, Utah's been on like every main slate so far this season. But last week against Baylor, Jaquindon Jackson had 19 carries, 129 yards, did not score. So he only ended up with 18 fantasy points because of some work through the air as well. But what you're looking at now is a situation where Jaquin and Jackson is the workhorse. Micah Bernard is out for the entire season. And so Jackson is going to be the workhorse. Now, if you're thinking that this is going to be a blowout, can you play Jalen Glover as the backup? Yeah, he got seven carries last week against Baylor and scored a touchdown. So I think both Jackson and Glover are in play. But Jackson's upside is kind of wild. If you remember near the tail end of last season, I mentioned this on one of the early season podcasts, near the tail end of last season, Jaquinta Jackson was a converted quarterback that was just breaking off 60 and 70 yard runs all willy nilly in November and January. And I think he has the potential to do that here against Weber State. If he breaks off one 60 yard run, then he's giving you decent value. If he breaks off two of them, look out. That's legitimate slate breaking upside from Jaquinta Jackson. He is one of my favorite running back plays of the week. And like I said, I'm not afraid to play Glover as well if you want to fade Jaquinta Jackson. 
Now, a lot of the other situations that we're looking at, there's just a lot of committees right there right now in college football. One that I think we can take a little bit of advantage of is right here at $5,500 on DraftKings, Katron Allen of Penn State. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, wait a minute, doesn't Penn State have Nick Singleton as well? Yeah, they do. But guess who's getting more carries right now? It's been Katron Allen. And so I would rather play the guy who's getting more carries at a cheaper price tag than where Nick Singleton's at right now. Is Nick Singleton the more talented player, brighter NFL future? Probably, but is he the one that they're giving carries to? No. So I would rather play K Tron Allen in this one. That's just my opinion. Now, also, Illinois, they've kind of been ran on both games so far this season with Devin Neal having a big game against him week two, and then Toledo's offense just marching right up and down the field against him in week one. So I really do like K Tron Allen of Penn State this week. Now, if you want to go completely opposite of what I said and play Nick Singleton, got no problem with that because Nick Singleton's still a very talented running back with a good matchup. But it seems to me like K Tron Allen is the guy who's getting more carries right now, which is why. I prefer him. Now, another guy in the 5K range that I like a lot is going to be Jalen White of Georgia Southern. So, he is a workhorse in the truest sense. He's got 30 carries through two games so far, and he has three receptions in both games so far. So even if Georgia Southern's trailing in this one, they're trying to catch up, they're trying to throw the ball around, guess who's probably going to be out there on the field? Jalen White of Georgia Southern. And so I really do like the play here against Wisconsin. I think a lot of people are going to be afraid to click him because they see he's going up against a Big Ten defense. So I think you might get a little bit of an ownership edge um, by going with Jalen White of Georgia Southern here this week. Now, an interesting play, not one that I would endorse as an optimal play or like a cash game play or a high floor play, Logan Diggs of LSU. So Brian Kelly recruited Diggs to Notre Dame. And when Brian Kelly left to come to LSU, Diggs was still at Notre Dame last year. But when Diggs hit the portal, he immediately booked it to Brian Kelly. Brian Kelly likes Logan Diggs. Brian Kelly knows how to use Logan Diggs. And last week against Grambling, he had 115 yards and a touchdown on 15 carries. So I really think Diggs is a high upside play. But LSU is another one of these teams that they're kind of a full-blown committee. And I don't really know what's going to happen with that backfield. But if I were to play one of them, it would probably be Logan Diggs. Now, in the 4K range, looking way down the board, there are two guys that I think do have a little bit of upside. And the first one is going to be Jalen Lucas of Indiana. So Indiana, heading into last week, was definitely looking like, I cannot find Jalen Lucas. Where is Jalen Lucas? I know how to find him. Anyway, heading into last week, Jalen Lucas was uh, you know, kind of in a committee here in this Indiana backfield, but he really looked like the lead dog in the committee last week, You know, rattling off um, 10 carries for 88 yards and two touchdowns, 8.8 yards per carry against Indiana State, and one of those touchdowns was a long one. He also caught four passes in this game as well, so I really do like the upside of Jalen Lucas in this Indiana backfield. And then the other 4K guy that I like is Cam Porter of Northwestern. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, well, Mike, Northwestern stinks. Why well, don't want to play anybody from Northwestern. Well, if there's one guy I'm going to play from Northwestern, it's going to be Cam Porter. He got 17 carries last week against UTEP, and he's also caught six passes so far this season. He is the workhorse running back for Northwestern. He's in when they want to throw. He's in when they want to run. He kind of does it all. He's going to get a lot of touches. Now, they might get blown out in this game against Duke because Northwestern's terrible, but I would honestly be okay with playing Cam Porter. I think he's a solid player. He's kind of settling into that Evan Hull role where he's going to get about 20 touches every every game. And I really do like the upside for a guy who costs only $4,300 on DraftKings for a guy who's going to touch the ball probably 20 times. Now, the last guy that I do want to mention is this week on DraftKings, we got some weird scenarios where I think with NFL starting, I think they got kind of lazy with their pricing and they had to take the whole slate down to fix a few of them. And they didn't fix this one. One, one misprice that I think they left here on it is Frank Gore Jr. We're going to talk about some more misprices when we get to the wide receiver position as well. But a clear misprice to me is Cam or Frank Gore Jr. of the Southern Miss Golden Eagles. So he is the son of Frank Gore, who it feels like just retired. Like I feel like Frank Gore was in my life for like 35 years. I and mean, it's crazy that he has a son now who's probably going to be in my life for another 35 years. But Frank Gore Jr. is the workhorse back for Southern Miss. Do not be fooled by the two carry totals so far. Both those games were incredible blowouts. I think this one against Tulane is going to be a little bit closer. But near the end of last season, Frank Gore Jr. was ripping off like 30 carry games and 30 fancy points games like it was nobody's business. I think he has a chance to do so again. And he's only $5,000 on DraftKings. I think he is a clear miss price and I'm going to be playing me some Frank Gore Jr. here this week. Now, before we move on to the wide receiver position, if you're sitting there thinking, well, all those running back plays are great. Well, who are you actually playing in your lineup? Well, there's a lot of other places that you can find me. First off, you can follow me on Twitter or 
X at Mike's Money Picks. I do tweet out the college football DFS rundown for every slate. I'll answer any questions via DMs or shout outs that you want to get for me. I'm also going to be talking about other slates with some tweets as opposed to a full podcast episode. So if you want my analysis for all the slates, you can follow me on X at Mike's Money Picks. I just, I just hate saying X. Elon Musk ruined Twitter. Um, also, the Fantasy Corner Discord is a place where me and a lot of other guys who play a lot of DFS do a lot of talking about college football. We, we do college football, golf, NFL, all of it, and it's in the Fantasy Corner Discord. Link is in the description if you want to talk about individual plays, ownership, strategy, whatever. We talk about a lot there in that Discord. And then lastly, I do write full slate articles, but I do not write for free. Um, so head on over to the Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks for every college football, golf, and NFL slate. I detail all of my favorite plays. I talk ownership. I talk strategy in a long form article every week. And you can get that on the Patreon for $3 a month. Lastly, we are now partnered with Sign Up Experts. So if you want to try something new this college football season, maybe you want to try player props on Underdog. Maybe you want to try just straight up betting on sportsbook sites. Head on over to signupexpert.com slash Mike's Picks, and you will get the best offers and promo codes for whatever sites are available in your area. It will sync to your location. And because we are partnered with Sign Up Expert, not only are you getting the best offers, but it shows me some support as well by using my links. So if you're looking to try something new, try a new site, try a new form of fantasy, whatever, head on over to signupexpert.com slash Mike's picks. All right, so let's go ahead and flip on over and talk about some wide receivers. Now, obviously, the top wide receiver play on the board, Marvin Harrison Jr. of Ohio State, and he is the best receiver in college football. He is one of the best pro prospects at the wide receiver position I have seen in a long time, and he has absolute slate-breaking upside, like he did last week with a 38 fancy point performance against Youngstown State. Now, he has a teammate, Emeka Ibuka, who is almost as good. If Harrison Jr. is the best receiver in college football, Ibuka is probably like sixth or seventh just off the top of my head, and Ibuka carries the same slate-breaking upside. I think Harrison Jr. is just the better play, but what will probably end up happening, if you're in ownership guy, if you're a pivot play guy and you want to gain leverage on all these guys that are going to click Harrison Jr. into their lineups, play a Mac Ibuka because if Harrison Jr. has an off night, it probably means that Ibuka is going to be having a big night and you can get leverage on those type of guys. If you're somebody who plays the game theory game, Ibuka is a guy that I would absolutely look to play. Now, I'm not interested in any other pass catcher from the Ohio State Buckeyes. I think largely they throw to these two guys so much that everybody else gets a little bit lost in the shuffle. Now, from the rest of this game, though, I want to talk about the other side of it. So we have some more misprices. First off is West, Western Kentucky's number one wide receiver, Malachi Corley. True alpha wide receiver. I played this guy all the time last year, like $8,000 on DraftKings when they were in Conference USA games because he is that good. He does get a lot of targets. And he's only $4,700 on DraftKings. It's probably because of the matchup against Ohio State and the lack of production so far this season. But guess what? I don't care. He's a great receiver. He's going to get the probably double-digit targets in this game. And if this game does end up going a little bit back and forth, you can play Corley, you can play Austin Reed and have enough money to still go up there and get Marvin Harrison Jr. So I absolutely think Malachi Corley makes a lot of sense this week. Now, what I do think you're going to see a lot of is of the people that are playing Kyle McCord with Marvin Harrison Jr., a lot of people are probably going to bring it back with Austin Reed and Malachi Corley. So you're going to have to find ways to make your lineup different in other aspects other than by playing those two as bringbacks. But I think they absolutely make sense for how cheap Austin Reed and Malachi Corley are both priced. Now, on paper, I am not intrigued by any of these other Western Kentucky wide receivers. Does that mean not to play them? No. It means that you probably are going to get less ownership on those guys because nobody else is seeing a whole lot of reason to play them either. So if you're an ownership pivot guy, play a Western Kentucky receiver not named Corley, and it might really pay off for you. Now, after this game... There's a few other games that I do want to talk about, like side-by-side -side with receivers on both teams. Did not mean to do that. The first one is LSU and Mississippi State. So LSU is a team that has two receivers who are pretty much taking up all of the targets and all of the production so far, Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. Now, Brian Thomas Jr. has done it better through two games. He is out-targeted, out-caught, and out-touchdowned Malik Neighbors in both games so far this season. Does that mean that that is going to continue? No, but it's just what we have so far here on this season. So on paper, Thomas shapes up to be the better play. He's probably going to be higher owned, which means that Neighbors is the ownership pivot guy. Now, on the other side of the ball from Mississippi State, because Jaquavius Marks is taking up so much of the usage at the running back position, they haven't really done a whole lot with the wide receivers, except for, I sure hope I pronounced this correctly, L Lediatric Griffin. 
Nailed it. So Lydiatric Griffin has nine receptions and two touchdowns through two games, and I think he could absolutely have another productive day here against LSU. And keep in mind, he's the only one with any kind of production so far, so he's going to be the highest-owned Mississippi State wide receiver. So if you want to be different, play some of the other guys. I don't know. None of them really intrigue me, if I'm being honest, but if you want to play any of the other guys, they are there as an option. Now, in terms of Florida State, if you're playing Jordan Travis, you're probably going to want to stack him with one wide receiver, and I would want that one wide receiver to be Keon Coleman. Look, Keon Coleman has just shown up in Tus not Tuscaloosa, in Tallahassee and just been better than Johnny Wilson. Johnny Wilson last year was very frustrating because he would be super inconsistent game to game in terms of earning targets. Well, Keon Coleman seems that he's going to earn targets game in, game out, and I think he's a better player than Johnny Wilson is, and I think he's a better play in fantasy than Johnny Wilson is, and I think he has a lot of upside with catch and passes from Jordan Travis. Now, in terms of some other situations in teams that are easier to target, look, my advice, number one on wide receivers, stack with your quarterbacks. Like if you're playing a pocket passing quarterback, go ahead and get his top receiver or his number two wide receiver right after that. But a few guys that I'm targeting outside of stacks, look, I think Tulane is a really easy team to pick guys from at the wide receiver position. They pretty much just played two of them. You know, Jaquan Jackson is a guy that, you know, so far has been their big play guy. Um, he's averaging over 20 yards of reception. He's averaging over 20 fantasy points per game. If he gets another bomb here against Southern Miss, he's going to pay off his price tag. The guy who has gotten more targets and more catches and who I think is probably the better play in my opinion, at least the more sound play, is, um, I forgot his first name, Keys, the third. He's got the keys. Um, he is $6,000 on DraftKings, and he is going to be operating out of the slot for Tulane. He's going to get a lot of targets, and if he finds the end zone, he is going to be um, a very solid play here this weekend. Why can I not remember his name? Now, let's go ahead and talk about some obvious misprices. So, I mentioned that we were going to do this at the wide receiver position as well as the running back position. The Kansas State-Missouri game has a few of them. First off, Phillip Brooks burst onto the scene last week. He was the perfect stacking partner with Will Howard. He had seven receptions for 94 yards and a touchdown against Troy, and he is only $5,700 on DraftKings. Somehow his price went down after that performance. I don't get it. If you're going to not play Phillip Brooks from this passing game, RJ Garcia is the only other Kansas State Wildcat that's really earning any kind of mentionable target share right now. But the Missouri game, has a guy that I believe is going to be in line for a big-time season in the SEC, Luther Burden III. He's the most talented player on this Missouri roster, former five-star recruit. Has 15 catches through two games, at least seven in both games, at least 96 yards in both games. Only scored one touchdown so far. If Missouri is able to keep this game close and score multiple touchdowns, then Burden is probably going to find himself in the end zone sooner rather than later, and I think he's a blatant misprice at only $5,900. Now, next up... There is the Louisville-Indiana game, who I mentioned have two cheap quarterbacks that you could stack together. It would absolutely be a viable strategy, in my opinion, to play these two quarterbacks from this game, play these two receivers that I'm about to mention from this game, and then spend up everywhere else. It would be a way to be totally different, and I think it could end up absolutely working. Now, Jamari Thrash is the Louisville receiver that I want to talk about. So Jeff Brom, coming over from Purdue, has always featured his number one receiver like a lot. Like, if you remember at Purdue, the days of Rondell Moore getting like 20 touches a game from the wide receiver position. Okay, maybe not 20 touches a game, but Rondell Moore touching the ball nearly every play, for, you know, for Purdue. And then it was David Bell the year after that. And last year it was Charlie Jones at Purdue that was doing that. Yeah, Jamari Thrash is that guy in the Jeff Brom offense here at Louisville. And he is a true alpha wide receiver coming over from Georgia State. He's got at least 24 fantasy points in both games. I think he is an absolute blatant misprice at $5,300 in a game that has sneaky shooting out potential. He is the only Louisville wide receiver I'm interested in, though. From the Indiana side of things, Cam Camper is injured, and he will likely miss this game. I'm not going to say for certain, but I believe he ends up missing this game. The guy that stepped up in week two in his place was Omar Cooper Jr. Now, it was a game against FCS competition. It was a blowout. Do does that necessarily mean it's going to happen the exact same way again? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But if it does happen again, Omar Cooper has a lot of upside. He had seven catches for over 100 yards last week for 20 fantasy points, and he's only $4,000 on DraftKings. If there is no Cam Camper, then Omar Cooper Jr. has a lot of upside if he is able to play in that role the same way he did last week. Now, the last game that I do want to talk about 
is the Georgia Southern and Wisconsin game. We have two receivers who I think are also mispriced. The Georgia Southern wide receiving core is very easy to target, in my opinion, because they pretty much only threw to two guys, Derwin Burgess Jr. and Caleb Hood. Those two guys are absolutely playable in cash, GPP, whatever, any format you're playing. I believe those two are both playable, especially if you're interested in getting in on this Wisconsin running game and using them as a bring back. Now, the other guy that I want to talk about from this game is Skylar Bell of Wisconsin, who is a starting wide receiver for the Wisconsin Badgers, and he is only priced at $3,000 on DraftKings. He caught five passes last week for 44 yards and a touchdown, and his price dropped from $3,600 to stone minimum $3,000. I don't know why that happened. I, I just don't. I think it's a blatant misprice on DraftKings' part. I'm willing to play him in my lineups at the stone minimum price. Does he have like slate-breaking upside? Probably not, but can he catch you five passes for 60 yards and a touchdown and get you, I don't know, 16 to 18 fantasy points out of $3,000? Yes, which is incredible value at that price tag. Now, the last blatant misprice that DraftKings exhibited this week was Brock Bowers of Georgia, only the best tight end in college football. He hasn't been super productive so far this season, but he is the best tight end in college football, and Georgia might be tested a little bit against this South Carolina defense. And so in what should be a closer game, uh, Brock Bowers should be able to get a lot of targets, should be able to get a lot of production, and he's an absolute blatant misprice at $4,700 on DraftKings. All right, so that does it for this episode here for the College Football Week 3 Main Slate Preview. Remember, subscribe to the channel or to the audio feed. That way, you'll be notified when all of our golf, college football, and NFL content drops. You can follow me on X at Mike's Money Picks. Join the Fantasy Corner Discord. Link is in the description. And if you want to see my full full written out article, head on over to the Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. All right, that does it for this Saturday Main Slate. Thank you guys for watching and listening for this far. Hopefully, I'm able to get you guys a lot of information that are going to help you guys win some money in DFS this Saturday. Uh, best of luck to everybody playing this Saturday, and I will see you next time.